Hello and welcome to our latest Money Show Money Masters podcast segment. I'm Mike Larson, Editor-in-Chief at Money Show, and today I'm pleased to welcome Dana Samuelson, President of American Gold Exchange, to the special sponsored edition of the podcast. How are you, Dana? I'm um, great, Mike. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you could join me. I mean, this is really an exciting time for metals investors. Uh, you know, as we speak, gold's back above $2,400 an ounce. Silver just top 32, uh, which I guess puts us, what, 11 and a half year high, something like that. Uh, what's going on? What's your big picture outlook and, and what are driving these markets here? Well, there's a lot going on. Uh, so that's a bit of a deep dive. Um, what we're seeing is a bunch of different factors coming together to drive the market all at the same time, which is unusual. And they're overriding the traditional inverse correlation that gold typically has to the value of the dollar versus other currencies and treasury yields. So normally when the dollar is strong, that pressures gold lower because most of the gold around the world is bought in dollars. And when the dollar is stronger against other currencies, it makes gold more expensive in other currencies. Yeah. So a strong dollar tends to dampen demand down. And we saw that in the fall of 2022 when the dollar got inordinately strong against every other currency because of interest rate differential here, gold got pushed down to about 1675, 1650 an ounce. I'm trying to remember the number off the top of my head, 1630. Yep. And um, that was very unusual. Uh, gold was on sale at that point in time. Also, gold doesn't do well when treasury yields are high, because if you can get an interest rate that's meaningful on your money, uh, gold doesn't pay a yield. So putting money in a T-bill or a money market uh, is more attractive. But yep. what's happening is we've had some real changes over the last, you know, since COVID blew up. First and foremost, uh, gold has been tracking our debt higher in the big picture. So if you go back to 2002, 2003, our debt at that point in time was $7 trillion. It took us 200 years about to get to 7 trillion. Between 2004 and 2014, our debt more than doubled to 17 trillion. Now between 2014 and 2000. 24, our debt has doubled again to 34 trillion. It's up five, six, seven fold from where it was, you know, at the start of this century, 2000. And gold is up the same amount. It's lumpy, but it's following our debt in the big picture. It's amazing when you throw those numbers around, you know, it kind of makes your head spin, right? <laughs> oh, it's I mean... crazy. And we're starting to see for the first time in mainstream press stories that talk about our debt and how it's becoming untenable. You know, just the other day, there was a story in the mainstream press from the government figures uh, releasing projections on the longevity of Medicare, Medicaid, and um, Social Security. And they're saying they're going to run out of money in 11 and 12 years from now, 2035 and 2036. Now, the last time I saw those projections, they were 2040 sometime. They've moved them up. So you've got our debt has exploded, um, and it exploded after COVID dramatically. Right. Yeah, we went up six trillion in, in a very short period of time. So that's that's a big factor helping to buoy gold in this time frame right now. The war in the Ukraine, when Russia invaded the Ukraine, has created another big trend change or it's increased a trend that had changed after the great financial crisis. So between the, the 1950s and 2010, central banks were mostly net sellers of physical gold. Uh, throughout most of that period of time, if you look at net central banks purchasing and sales of gold, they were all negative. There are some times when it, they were positive, but not many. Yeah. Following the great financial crisis, starting in 2011, central banks became net buyers of gold. Now, they're the people that have the printing press. They know what they're doing. They're creating a lot more debt out of thin air. So they're buying gold for the first time in mass, I think, to hedge their bet, right? They're, they know what they're doing. So annually, mines produce about 2,500 tons of gold every year, new production. It's pretty consistent. From 2010 to 2021, central banks have been buying about 500 tons of gold a year, one-fifth of the mining production annually. Since the Ukraine war started and we sanctioned Russia and we seized their assets, and we took them off the SWIFT international banking system, there's been this move among West, Eastern, excuse me, Eastern countries to de-dollarize. So they're doing more 
trading in their own currencies outside of the dollar. Saudi Arabia is now selling oil to China and India outside of the dollar, which is a first. But central banks have stepped up their gold buying as a result of this, because if you have money in the U.S., either in treasuries or in cash, and the U.S. can seize it, sanction it, like we did with Russia, you've got a problem. But if you have gold in your vault, that can't be seized or sanctioned. So central bank gold buying has more than doubled in the last two years, from 500 tons a year to 1,000 tons a year. Now they're buying 40% of what mines produce annually. And this is a big trend higher just in the last two years. And what I sense, I can't prove it, I've been doing this for 44 years, when I first got into these markets in the early 80s, the physical gold market dominated the price. Once we got into the mid-90s and computers came up and they became ubiquitous, everybody started using them, we're enhancing our trading capacity, high-speed trading, much, and this explosion of wealth, mm -hmm. so the futures market took over the the dominant factor in the metals price. I think that all this gold physical buying that's been going on is starting to, to change that situation where the physical market's starting to dominate the market more than the futures market. This is a big potential change in trend that I suspect is starting to happen. And that's why gold is running higher now, uh, especially in the last couple of months, it's starting to be meaningful. Yeah. So you've got you know, these two fundamental trends, you know, debt and now central bank buying that are helping to buoy the price. Um, now, on top of that, we've got we've had problems with our banking system. We had bank failures last year. So there's a, some fear over that. Um, but more importantly, we have two wars that are going on and gold climbs a wall of worry. And what wars do, especially in the Middle East, is they affect the oil price. They put the oil price up. We're in yeah. an inflationary environment, too, because of all the printing. So all these factors are really starting to come together to mesh to help propel this gold price while the dollar has been stronger and while treasury yields have been the highest they've been in years. Right. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> as somebody who's been I mean, you've been following this market even longer than I have. And it really is amazing to see those traditional things. Again, you mentioned the treasury yields, you mentioned the dollar uh, get overwhelmed by some of these other things that, that have sort of maybe been percolating in the background, but are really in the forefront now. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And this is very unusual. So what happens if the U.S. goes into recession and we increase our debt or our treasury yields fall or the dollar falls? Gold has, you know, could get a real tailwind from that event as well. And, you know, five years ago when gold was 1300 and hadn't broken over a six year top at 1375, if you would ask me, you know, when are we going to see $3,000 gold? I would have said, oh, that's a long way off. He got a long ways to go. Now it's five years later, 2,400. And I'm saying, you know, $3,000 gold isn't that far off from here. And it's no, really a stunning change of events in five years, mostly because of the pandemic, the economic response to the pandemic, and then the the, the wars that are going on, uh, the two that are going on globally now. But yeah. these are, you know, Vladimir Putin's not going away until he's dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that, what a mess. What a mess. You know, you mentioned central bank buying. I'm curious, where are you seeing that very powerful? I mean, I've read a couple articles that a lot of it's coming out of China, for example. Is that is that your experience as well? Well, it's countries around the globe. China is one of the biggest buyers. And it's not just the central bank. It's the populace, too, because over the last couple of years, COVID has really affected the Chinese economy. Uh, their property market, we know, is in the shambles and their stock market has not been doing well. So gold is really one of the only other things Chinese public can buy. And I do think the collapse of the yen over the last six months is contributing uh, to gold's uh, allure uh, in the Far East because there are a lot of trading partners that do business with Japan over there. And gold has done nothing but go up in, in yen dramatically with the weakening of the yen. So you know, and the big picture, gold has averaged about 8% annual gains every year for the last 20 years in almost every currency. Now, it's a little bit lumpy. It gets ahead of itself and behind itself at times. Uh, but the, the average gain is about 8% in every currency for 20 years. So um, let's see. It's not just 
China that's buying gold. You know, it's uh, surprisingly Poland bought a lot of gold last year. I don't have the figures for all the countries, but they they bought a significant amount. Now Russia's on their doorstep, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that, that could be a contributing factor. In fact, I'm sure that it is. <laughs> Yeah. Let's switch gears briefly and talk about silver then. Um, obviously, it's getting a lot of attention because after kind of sitting there for a while, it's playing a little bit of catch up. Or as I said, we're talking around $32 last time we checked. Um, you know, beyond what's happening in gold and just precious metals in general, what do you see as sort of being the demand and supply outlook for silver on that side of the ledger? Well, with the green technology and EVs, solar panels, silver is in supply deficit meaning that the demand for silver is higher than the annual mining production uh, for the last two years. And it's projected to be that way for the coming several years as well. Uh, we see a lot more attrition in physical silver for industrial use than we do in gold, because gold doesn't have as many industrial uses as silver does. Yep. So what, what matters at the margin matters more for silver and going into supply deficit uh, I think is having starting to have a, an impact there. But more importantly, when gold runs, it tends to run in a you know bottom left, upper right movement. Silver tends to go sideways and then plays catch up with a vengeance. <laughs> and we saw that in 20 uh between 2008 and 2011 when gold went from a thousand to 1900. Silver resisted that for quite a bit. And when it finally decided to move over about $15 an ounce, it went to 48 on a bullet. I mean, on an absolute bullet. And basis those previous highs in 2011 at $1,900 gold and $48 silver. Today, gold is about 27% higher in price, yet silver is about 33% lower in price than it was against its previous highs in 2011. And what this silver move here is, is I think the tip of this iceberg of silver breaking up breaking out and playing catch up with a vengeance. We saw it again when, when COVID hit in 2020, gold went from about 1500 to 2070 uh, pretty sharply and silver couldn't get up over $18 to save its life for about six or eight months. And then it went from 18 to 29 on a bullet. <laughs> and since then we haven't really been over 29 for three, four years. And we started this run in gold in March at 2040, it's 2400 now. At that point in time, silver was about $22.50, and now it's $32. So it's playing catch up. The gold to silver ratio, which measures how many ounces of silver it takes to equal an ounce of gold, has been over 82 to 1 for the last six months. That's a very high figure, meaning mm -hmm. gold is leading and silver is lagging by quite a bit. But now that ratio is falling pretty sharply down to about 75 to 1. Uh, so if you look at if you follow that, you know, silver could go to 62 to 1 relative to gold at this price that puts silver at forty dollars and i actually think silver's heading to to 40 but it's going to be a little choppy in the short term <laughs> nothing goes straight up and stays straight up especially uh precious metals yeah absolutely uh dana in the time we have left i mean if somebody wants to get involved in this market they're they, you know they're just starting out what kind of advice would you have for them what are some ways that, that you could help them again capitalize on this or just you know find protection in the precious metals market if that's what they're looking for well, I'm in the physical precious metals market. That's what I do. I handle the physical product, ounces of gold, ounces of silver, mostly made by sovereign mints, the U.S. mint, Canadian mint, Austrian mint. If they were ice cream, I would tell you they were vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, the three most <laughs> popular flavors. We also handle refinery-made bars, uh, but I think the sovereign minted coins, which are just round bars made by a sovereign government, are better for the public to own for a host of reasons I won't get into here. Um, but we help people with the physical arena. So that's what I can really do. Uh, my company's American Gold Exchange. We're located out of Austin, Texas. We're a national uh, physical precious metals mail order dealer. Our website has the most widely traded, competitively priced items on it uh, with transparent live pricing. And we're very competitive. It's a very competitive market and we're always in the hunt. Uh, and we're consultative by nature. So if someone's interested in being in the physical markets, yep. that's really what we do. And we we help individual clients on a one-on-one -on -one basis, answer all their questions. You know, we want to help you succeed in what you're trying to accomplish. So we look at the relationship between gold and silver. We do a bit with platinum and palladium as well, which I think are undervalued in this market, especially relative to gold. They're both scarcer and they have 
some pretty high industrial uses. Mm -hmm. um, but right now they're underperforming by quite a bit and they are lagging. Uh, so that's another area that we specialize in. And I also do a lot with vintage old U.S. gold coins. I'm an expert in those. I'm I'm a nerd when it comes to uh, <laughs> vintage U.S. gold coins minted pre-1933. So that's another sector of our market that we deal in. But for most people who just want to own physical gold or silver, you know, the ounces that are made by the U.S. Mint, the Canadian Mint, and the Austrian Mint are the best ways to go for not only purchase price, but liquidity. When you want to sell, these are easy for you to sell anywhere to any reputable dealer. And while I'm on that subject, it's very important that you deal with a reputable dealer. We're an unregulated business and there are opportunists in our marketplace. So find someone who has a great reputation and has been in the market a long time. That's really the two uh, things you can do to help protect yourself from opportunists who might bait and switch you, which is a classic ploy that uh, some of our unscrupulous uh, participants in this market like to do. Well, Dana, I think that's great advice, practical, uh, helpful, and, and I think the viewers are going to get a lot out of it. I do appreciate you taking some time to discuss the market dynamics. Um, viewers, if you're watching or if you're listening on one of the audio podcast platforms, you can find out more about Dana and American Gold Exchange at www.amergold.com. That's A-M-E-R gold.com. You can also meet up with Dana at our Money Show, excuse me, Money Show Master Symposium Las Vegas. So that's going to be August 1st to 3rd at Paris, Las Vegas. Dana will be there to answer any questions you might have for him. Dana, again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Mike. I'm looking forward to going to Las Vegas and see you this summer. It's going to be great.